This is So Life Wants You Dead, a show that explores the intersection of illness, disability, healing, and creativity. Seven years ago, I was told I would need an emergency organ transplant. Before they put me under, I closed my eyes and imagined myself writing. Now, all these years later, I can say that was honestly what saved me. Well, that and a brand new liver. I'm Nora Logan, and this is a podcast on how looking at death helps you live. Today, my guest is Charlie Fitz. Charlie is a UK-based sick and disabled artist and writer. Since becoming sick, Fitz has turned to her art practice as a meditative process, a form of disability activism, and as a means to understand and reclaim her experience of illness and trauma. On today's episode, we talk about Charlie's experience with ehlers danlos Syndrome, her time in hospital, having to outsource care, her mental health, and her art practice. This conversation was a long time in the making, and I'm so happy to be able to share it with you today. Content warning. We talk about death and suicide in this episode. If you or a loved one are experiencing suicidal ideation or need support, please reach out. You can find resources in our show notes. Here's the conversation. Welcome to So Life Wants You Dead, Charlie. How are you doing today? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy you're here. This has been a long time in the making. We first spoke in the summer of 2020, so and we're speaking in the, the summer of 2022, so it's really good to have you on the show. You've written about disabled joy, rest, and rage as resistance. What's something that brought you joy this week? This week, it was actually my birthday, and I came to London for the podcast, but I got to go and stay with friends and just have dinner with close friends, which is not something I've been able to do for a while because of pandemic and shielding, so that brought me a lot of joy. Happy birthday. Thank you. So can you talk a little bit about what Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is and how it's generally treated, just the ins and outs of it for people who don't know? Yeah, so Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is actually uh, a group of, at the moment, 13 known conditions, and they're connective tissue disorders. They're, connect- they're, they're all characterized by kind of fragile skin, hypermobile joints, and tissue fragility throughout the body. But each individual type has like different general characteristics, and most of them have a known genetic origin. I have classical Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and I also have the gene mutation for another similar condition so all my joints are affected I can kind of have a dislocation anywhere in my body my spine is quite severely affected so I've because I have an unstable spine that's affected my neurological system and I've had to have a neck fusion I recently had to have another surgery on my lower spine and then also a few of my organs because of the tissue fragility throughout my body a few of my organs are affected so my gastrointestinal system my gynecological system my bladder my heart yeah, it's like a whole, it's like a body, body-wide illness. Mm-hmm. In terms of treatment in the UK, from my own experience and from the experience of everyone I know personally with EDS, yeah. the treatment is lacking. So we have one clinic which has a three-week inpatient stay and they supposedly invite you to stay at this clinic, teach, do physio with you and teach you how to manage at home. Now, the condition affects in terms of severity, affects people on a spectrum. Some people it's quite mild, some people it's very severe. Every time I've tried to get into this inpatient stay, which I've heard really mixed things about, they've always said I'm too complex and too severe. So at the moment, I don't really have any treatment on the NHS for my condition. So my treatment is me researching, fundraising, and seeing private consultants around the world who specialize. That's how I get treatment. I don't really have a GP who understands my illness or any kind of consultant who oversees my care. So you don't have anyone close to home that you can reach out to? No. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And speaking of fundraising, you had a surgery in Spain recently, which you fundraised for. Yeah. Can you speak to that process a little bit and what it's like kind of to have to travel for treatment? Yeah, so if my surgeon in Barcelona 
and, and and his whole clinic are like one of the places that I do feel like I can reach out to not just for not just for neurological advice but kind of for anything because they've developed a really good support network for people with our conditions they know all the different specialists so the process of seeing him originally so I've seen him twice for two different surgeries was a really unusual one because I was before my neck fusion I was completely stuck in a bed I had full-time care I was struggling to breathe eat speak think I was having seizures I was having periods of time where I would forget who I was or forget Mm -hmm. who my husband was I bit my husband once because I didn't know who anyone was and I was I was gonna die in the UK they said that they would put me on palliative care so they would just give me medication essentially to like make me more comfortable they didn't really recognize that anything needed to be done and so we fundraised which was a really unusual experience because I was grateful but I also felt extremely like ashamed and guilty about having to ask family and friends and strangers for money and also I was made to feel as though I was making this decision so if I had another condition like cancer and people would expect me to go for whatever treatment was recommended to me but because I was going outside of the NHS, a lot of people didn't understand it and made it seem like I was choosing to have this really unusual treatment instead of just trying to stay alive, right? Mm-hmm. When your options are going into palliative care yeah. or seeking treatment elsewhere, yeah, it's pretty wild that people would react in that way, that it's sort of a choice because palliative care doesn't feel like that's a, an ideal option. Yeah, I was in my 20s at this time, so... It's a bit when there is there is someone who is operating on people like me who says that there is an option that will help. So I had the fusion. Only after having the fusion did this clinic I mentioned earlier, one of the doctors at that clinic said that those surgeons have saved your life. And this doctor has written it in a letter that you made the right choice. This choice is just so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, they saved your life. They sh- we should be studying these things, but we're just not in the UK. And one doctor on the NHS has admitted that to me, but the rest kind of just keep quiet about it right. or say that it's too risky to do the surgery. So it's a really unusual experience. And surprising because I, I feel like the NHS is fantastic for certain things. And then for others, it really is lacking. Clearly, with Ehlers-Danner syndrome, it's really lacking. Yeah. But because it's so good for other things... People are shocked. Yeah. I feel like that's sort of why people might be like, oh, it's a choice for you to go Mm -hmm. elsewhere because the NHS is held as this sort of bastion of, Mm -hmm. we're so lucky to have the NHS type thing. But then it's so lacking in really serious cases. Yeah, and I think it's... I mean, I think it's a mixture of so many different things. It's not just a funding issue because that because I'm I'm like as left as it gets. So I'm like a great believer in the NHS, but it has been kind of destroyed mm-hmm. for the last like ten years or so, which is a whole other podcast. But it's not just the underfunding and the under researching and all that. There's more to it than that. Maybe because it's a condition that predominantly affects women, mm-hmm. because it's such a complex condition. I also think there's a lot to do with in the UK we don't have any specialists of internal medicine Mm -hmm. I don't know what they call it in the US but in Barcelona they call it internal medicine and that means like whole body medicine so conditions that go past the barriers of what we've told medicine go past like urology or cardiology or they don't sit nicely in one clinic it's the same in the US we don't have any specialists there's no one who studies that that studies conditions like that When I am in Barcelona, I have an internal medicine specialist who studies conditions like EDS that affect the whole body. Mm. They know that I'm going to have 10 comorbid connected conditions because of the way it affects my body. Whereas in the UK, if you have a list of 10 diagnoses and you're a young woman with a history of trauma, the it's all in your head, psychosomatic illness, Mm -hmm. hysteria, light is flashing in their head. And it becomes... Uh, is this person to be believed that's mm-hmm. the treatment rather than, oh, let's get to the bottom of this, mm-hmm. which is how it is, clearly is treated in Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, and prior to me, I, st- I study medical humanities, prior mm-hmm. to me studying medical humanities, I would have probably said to you that this is coming from a completely malicious place. But I actually don't think it is now. I think it's coming from a place in which ideology is about certain types of medicine in this country like psychosomatic illness are still so strong and Mm -hmm. so heavily believed and there are specialists in this country who are so well respected writing books 
about psychosomatic illness that it's just like really dominant still. Yeah. They're just calling it something else. It's like hysteria didn't really go anywhere. They're just right. they're just they've just renamed it and repackaged it. And it's just passed down through the generations and now it's become culture. Yeah. Actually to that point, it's part and parcel of the same thing. In your article, it's all in your head, the dangerous legacy of the sick role. You write about being a patient and this idea that we have to as children we're cared for and protected. And then when we grow up, we need to contribute back to society. Mm -hmm. Would you read an excerpt from that? Yeah, so this excerpt, I'm I'm referring to a guy called Talbot Parsons, who was Mm -hmm. a kind of conservative sociologist. And his, his idea of the sick role, which he wrote about in 1950, which has been kind of negatively influential on our culture and our medical systems. So it says... Throughout childhood, we rack up a sizable debt to society, and as adults, we must pay back this debt by working, earning, and being contributing members of society. If we become ill, we enter the sick role, which, whilst being a deviation, entitles us to some concessions, such as a break in our work, our studies, or what he terms normal activity. However, in return, the sick person must must submit entirely to the doctor in order to get better, which must be the only goal for the sick person. And it sort of ties in with this idea of these psychosomatic illnesses and not being believed. You've written a lot about these issues because they're... And I so appreciate your writing because it's it's something that we really don't see very much. People don't write about this stuff that much. And you've written about this edict, you're too young to be sick, which is something I heard so much in my own hospital experience. And I think it's really common for people to hear from medical professionals, you're too young to be sick. Can you tell me a bit about this trope and, and also what this idea of the sick role means? Yeah, so... When I was first, I mean, there's no like, there's no beginning to my illness kind of narrative, because now that we understand all my conditions, there's always been signs since I was born. But when I was first in hospital for a serious illness, it was a pulmonary embolism, so a blood clot in my chest. And I went to hospital three times before I was believed because they said, you're so young, your chest hurts, it's, it's going to be just like hangover for, for a chest infection. The idea that being young means that you're not going to have serious illness is ridiculous to me and in terms of the sick role the sick role is this idea that was written about in this book called the social system from the 1950s and medical students as far as I'm aware used to actually study this but now it's it's not something that's studied anymore but it's just so in, in my opinion it's so ingrained in society and so the idea is that chronic illness does not exist in the sick role you are healthy as a young person and then at some point in your life usually when you're older you get sick but because you've been a contributing member of society because you've you've worked and you've paid into the system and you've done your bit you are entitled to treatment and to some time off of like being a regular performing member of society Mm -hmm. and then you either get better or you don't but you don't continue being ill you either get better or your life ends those are the kind of options in this role so there's like no place for chronic illness or really disability Mm -hmm. in that kind of system and I think that from my experience that's really fed into culture there's a a writer called Arthur W. Frank who wrote a book called The Wounded Storyteller and he spoke he was I think he was a cancer patient and he spoke to loads of different people with with different illnesses and he found that their stories would fit into lots of different narratives and one of the narratives came kind of straight from this sick role like people continue to tell their their illness story as like well one day I got sick and then it goes through then I then I got treatment and then I either got better or I, or I didn't when it doesn't work like that it's so much more complex than that but we but because of how we see illnesses represented in the media how we see them represented in television shows we're always trying to like p- put them into these kind of these neat narratives mm-hmm. And it just doesn't work like that in real life. And so many people that I speak to, especially young women, are told when they go to hospital, well, you're too young to be sick or you look too well or the, the most horrific one is that you're too good looking. I've heard, I've heard people say that. Really? Like, so wow. it's like this really strange cultural phenomenon that I should be able to look at you and see that you're unwell. It doesn't work like that. I think my mum actually has said to a doctor before, do you have x-ray vision? 
Um, Good for your mum. <laughs> yeah, honestly. So I, when I first was, I mean, my illness story doesn't really have like a clear narrative because I don't think that most people do, especially if you have a complex illness. And even if you don't have a complex illness, if you have something like, and I'm going to keep giving this cancer as the obvious one because everyone kind of knows someone who's had cancer and, and can relate to like cancer stories. Even if you have cancer and your cancer treatment, most people after having cancer treatment then have chronic conditions because the cancer treatment is like a like a poison, right? So even in those stories, it's not as simple as it's made out to be. There's also, in regards to this thing that people say of, you're too young to be here, you're too good looking, you, it's unbelievable that people have actually said that to you. Mm. Not because you're not good looking, you're very good looking. <laughs> <laughs> But it ties into the advocacy and the energy that one has to find within themselves to, if they're not receiving a diagnosis, receive a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And it incenses me, actually, because there's so many people who, if they're living with chronic illness, maybe don't have the energy to Mm -hmm. continuously advocate for themselves and to take it at face value that, you know, someone might be told, well... Maybe you're just tired. You're too young. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the other one you said? You're too young to be sick. You're too good looking to be sick. There was a third one. I can't remember. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> to go away from an appointment with a GP or a consultant and say, oh, well, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm okay, but I still feel terrible. Mm-hmm. And then maybe not be able to find the energy to, to find out what's wrong with them. 100%. I've tried to will my illness away at times and I'm someone who is kind of fairly strong-willed and I have respect for doctors but it's not like I'm in a a cultural position in which I have the utmost respect for the medical professional and believe them as though it's the word of Mm -hmm. some almighty being right like I'm not in that position and still because I've been told this so many times I think well maybe if I just live a normal life Mm -hmm. I'll be able to and it doesn't work because it's not in my it's not something that I'm manifesting it is an organic illness that's affecting my body right and I think before I studied medical humanities I would have always said to you like this doctor is just they just don't want to deal with me they just don't want to take responsibility for it but since studying medical humanities there is such an interweaving of so many issues going on number one doctors are taught that they should know everything in my course there are doctors in my course and they are at their wits end because they're taught that they should know everything and that medicine is complete and it's not Mm -hmm. there's so much we do not know about the body especially the stomach the stomach is like a second brain and they say it's like the deep ocean of the body there is just so much to discover so yes psychosomatic connections are real Mm -hmm. and the way that we're feeling and things that happen to us do affect our body but the way in which we understand them at the moment is not good enough and the way in which it's treated at the moment is not good enough because people are treated as though they're making it up rather than that our body is way more connected to what's going on in our lives than, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, and it's the, 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 the fact that stress has an effect on our body, the fact that everything that's going around outside of us has really has a physiological effect on us mm-hmm. is not accepted wisdom in mm-hmm. the medical profession. Mm-hmm. And we ha- it's an ever-evolving thing. So... For unfortunately, the way that it sounds like doctors are trained, although I don't know because I'm not a doctor myself, it's that they're told that they have to know everything. Mm-hmm. When actually we know we know that medical research is still is an evolving process and it it's going to change over time. And like you say, with studies of the microbiome, we're just like we've done a tiny fraction of mm-hmm. of what we may know eventually. So when you're in a situation where you're having to be in continuous contact with the medical establishment I'm actually curious to know how you feel about this because as someone who's in continuous relationship with the medical establishment and will be for the rest of my life Mm -hmm. I I go between these two feelings well actually many feelings not just two but but I have like I oscillate between having massive respect for them and for having been under the NHS and also in the medical system in the US massive respect for what they do and how they've helped me and and then also really seeing 
the shortcomings of the mm-hmm. system and the doctors that I deal with and sometimes feeling like I'm not even seen. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious to know how you, just from having read your work and seen your artwork, I know that you have similar feelings of like, I have this respect for, for this person who's helping me, mm-hmm. but also I can see the shortcomings. For myself, I find a lot of frustration and not being able to really voice the frustration and be heard. Mm-hmm. Do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so I have voiced the frustration in multiple situations, and that's when the my treatment plan has quickly switched into okay, this is psychological because this 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 patient is irate with me, they're angry with me, they're getting frustrated. They're obviously this can't be because they're very ill and they've been treated badly by the system this must be because they're a difficult patient right and they're ticking the boxes that i've been told to look for young woman comes into hospital a lot etc etc so i've stopped doing that even though i don't i i don't advocate for that i think it's all situational and i take it out on my artwork (laughs) i think because i just don't have the energy to go to hospital and fight with doctors you well speaking of that you have an artwork that's a photo of a man who is seemingly playing the doctor role in front of a woman and written next to the photo are the words it is not your fault but you must repay the debt three times and then as the text gets smaller on the fourth line not is crossed out to make it it is your fault but you must repay the debt on the fifth line it says it is your fault you must repay your debt and on the final line it says it is all in your head Can you talk a bit about this piece and how it plays into this idea of the sick role and also the guilt patients feel that's both projected onto them, but also just a natural feeling that can arise from being in the system? Yeah, so this piece, I think it's almost like it could be read as that experience of there's this one particular hospitalization that I have in my mind and the beginning is the kind of doctor trying to do their best, trying to go through all the different scenarios with you. And then it get they get more frustrated and they are coming up to dead ends because you're more complex than they've been taught to understand. And then eventually the frustration is being taken out on you. And I've ha- I think that this happens a lot. And then at the very end, you feel as though you've let them down <laughs> by not being a perfect model patient who they can fix. And you feel like, you're causing it somehow. And I think that's what this piece is kind of speaking to, that really strange relationship in which you're trying to almost please the medical professional by by being someone who they can fix and solve, which just isn't always the case. A lot of the time, they're not gonna be able to fix you. They're not gonna be able to make it better. But if they actually started listening to you and stopped looking at you as someone to be fixed and started listening to you and say, okay, so we can't fix you, but how can we make your life better? What do we know? your day-to-day struggle Mm -hmm. I think that that would change a a lot of outcomes for me definitely yeah and what does it look like to support you Mm -hmm. within your illness and within your condition Mm -hmm. rather than trying to fix it wholesale when that's not really an option for many people Mm -hmm. I remember when I was when I I had a mystery illness and the symptom was liver failure but they couldn't figure out what the origin of it was. Mm-hmm. And the amount of frustration that I received from doctors who were trying to save my life, mm-hmm. but I felt badly. I felt guilty that they couldn't figure it out. And even a couple of years after my transplant, when I was still very sick and going in and out of the hospital all the time, I ran into an infectious disease doctor who really, he, he was very upset that he couldn't figure it out at the time and he had done a biopsy on my my old liver he took it out and tried to figure out what the disease was that I had Mm -hmm. if any and he in that short interaction of running into him in the street he just he just looked at me wide-eyed and shook his head and was like so they just never we never figured it out did we and at that point I had gone through a lot of work on my own to kind of accept that I wouldn't ever know what it was that caused me to get so sick. Mm -hmm. But I find still today that it really bothers other people more than it does me. Yeah. Do you find the same thing? A hundred percent. Because, yeah, I think it's a real big issue with the way that we're training medical professionals. And the medical professionals that come on my course, the medical humanities course, they... I have told a few of them have told me that they kind of get mocked by other 
doctors for being on this course and for being interested in in this kind of side of it and which is teaching them how to view patients as human beings and teaching them where their stigmas come from and teaching them that they don't have all the answers and that's okay but how can they give good care so that is seen as a a negative thing in a lot of the mainstream medical institutions which is just shocking beyond and I've had conversations with fellow students about how they're taught to operate on people and how they're taught to view people as kind of objects because that would make it easier and I'm not trying to downplay how difficult it is to operate on a human being I can't imagine doing it myself of like course. we're going back into the I have that much respect yeah, for this individual yeah. and I don't want to bring them down because da, 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 da. but at the same time you have to recognize the shortcomings in your profession and I think that's that's where people fall short because the training is clearly you're taught to not recognize the shortcomings and Mm -hmm. it's a unique thing for doctors to want to go and study medical humanities which extremely unique if I could just have doctors who chose to go on that course that would be amazing that would be amazing (laughs) because it because your patient care will go up Mm -hmm. tenfold a hundredfold even Mm -hmm. because you'll suddenly see the patient as a full human being yeah and for myself, I felt like I worked really hard to be humanized to an extent that I look back and feel like I was a bit psychotic, you know, mm-hmm. and even still I try to introduce myself and have them know my name and learn their name and really try to make it more of a human experience. Mm-hmm. But patients shouldn't have to take that labor on. Mm-hmm. Is that something that through the course of your all your treatments felt like you you've also picked up or have you come to a point where you kind of just you know how you're gonna be in a certain moment like you're not not always trying so hard is what I'm saying just because I only say that because you seem like a very level-headed person who's Mm -mm. (laughs) (laughs) I'm level-headed in this nice this nice room with a nice understanding person (laughs) yeah I I definitely am not in like I I just unless I unless I thought my life was in danger I just avoid the UK hospitals at the moment. So I'm probably not in like the best. I haven't come to a like a really positive place with it. I would say that it's not that I haven't when I'm in Barcelona I have still experienced doctors who will speak to the man in the room rather than the patient who will start touching you and grabbing you without definitely not my surgeon. My surgeon is he's just a sweetheart. He cried the first time he saw me like walk after my surgery. He's just a sweetheart. It's just I can't I don't have any bad words to say about him but some of the people that he has had to work with over the years will still do all these kind of things where they treat you like an object rather than a human being to some extent I do what you do and I try and remind them that I'm there and I try and learn about what's going on and to some extent I just let it happen to me and I go into another world but I only feel comfortable doing that when I know I'm under that surgeon in that place. I think if I was in the UK again, I haven't been hospitalized in the UK for many years. Mm -hmm. And I I hardly have any medical care here, which is not really a good thing. I need medical care. So I I think I'm just in a place of avoidance, Mm -hmm. which is not something I am advocating for. It's just like the total honest answer. My mental health got to the point where I just needed to, to just completely have no interactions with medical professionals and the ones that I have had have just gone nowhere Mm -hmm. which is a really sad state to be in with the NHS yeah I mean especially when there's so many good things about the NHS it's such and you're a big believer in it yeah it's it's a shame to not be able to use it yeah so your exhibition radical acts of care is inspired by Johanna Hedva's sick woman theory which states that the most anti-capitalist protest is to care for, for another and to care for yourself can you tell me a bit about this exhibition and the origins of the project? They mm-hmm. resulted in some really beautiful pieces of work. Thank you. So yeah, the, the origins of this, it kind of, it came together quite organically because my husband, uh, Oscar Winter, he's also like an artist and a creative. He was, he is my carer. He cares for me. And at the time was caring for me full time. I had the option of getting carers, but it just wouldn't have been enough hours for what I needed. And so because we're both creative, we created this really natural, continuous, collaborative process. We, we were just writing together. We were taking photos together. We were making pieces of artwork together just in our day to day lives. And I started to think about how really famous artists, they'll have loads of people working on a big piece but they'll be the only ones credited. And there were things that I wanted to do and things that he wanted to do that required assistance. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that really honoured what Johanna Hedford's 
work was talking about, that honoured, this kind of shared vulnerability, shared fragility in which, yes, he's doing most of the physical labour because I was the one who was physically sick and physically disabled. But my husband is neurodivergent, he has, has autism. And so I'm often doing other types of labour within our relationship, but it's all kind of shared and it's all consensual and it just works really well, our relationship. <laughs> sounds kind of big-headed but it does it works really yeah. well and so we, we began making these pieces around this idea of turning this idea of radical acts of care into artworks and into an, an, ex, an exhibition and then we originally we put on the exhibition at a restaurant that we used to work in to fundraise for my first surgery and then it kind of just like snowballed from there and it's become kind of just an approach to work sometimes I make solo pieces and so does he but there is often an element of collaboration and I always want to honour it and I always want to credit, give credit where credit's due. Mm -hmm. If a piece is made by a group of individuals, I don't know why the group of individuals who've all worked together, it kind of like, it's kind of like a blueprint for how I want society to be, right? Yeah, and collaboration is also care, right? 100%. So creating something together, it is so funny. I never really thought about it like that with these huge artists really famous artists having or you think about Leonardo da Vinci even having mm -hmm. you know 100 people working for him but it's Leonardo da Vinci who's the, the famous person and obviously continues to today but I love this idea of being vulnerable enough to demonstrate care mm -hmm. within your relationship and also within your collaboration and your partnership mm -hmm. and it's sort of pushing against what we've been conditioned to, the way we've been conditioned to work mm -hmm. in terms of being willfully independent, needing to, to do things at a rate that isn't really, um, it, it's not feasible for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. How, like, you, you've written so much about this idea of care within your relationship and it's also shown in a lot of your artworks. How does it show up? Like, what are some examples of how it shows up in your relationship with Oscar? In everyday life. Yeah. In everyday life. <laughs> so in terms of in terms of it being like an interdependent, so just both of us are like a... We, I mean, luckily we get on extremely well, so we're together most of the time. I don't know what medicine I take, and I don't know when I take it, but I always take it because Oscar hands it to me, <laughs> and I trust that he's giving me the right pill, and, and I know that I'm extremely privileged because... I guess, and this is, there are people who are who are, who are dependent on on their partners and it isn't like this. And because of the system that we live in in the UK, you know, it leads to really bad things. So I don't think that we should have to be dependent on one another. I think that there should be systems in place where we can be independent. Sorry, that's just my, my side note. Yeah. <laughs> but in my really privileged position in which I have someone who I totally trust and, and, and he totally trusts me, he he will do my medicine, he will bathe me, he will dress me, he will do all these things and I will draft his emails or he'll ask if he's come, coming across rude or things that he can't gauge in social situations. I'll do those things and I'll say, no, you're not. It's okay. You know, and I'll, I'll sometimes, if he has an interview coming up, he'll ask me to like, he'll like get like a script written down because that kind of scenario like talking like this would be really really stressful for him mm -hmm. and he would need to mask which is like a um a kind of way of coping with uh, certain situations as someone with autism so there's like I used to view it as he was caring for me but I'm starting to realize that we do care for each other and that's why it works so well mm -hmm. because maybe if I was with someone who didn't who who looked down upon care they would see me as a burden as much as society would. So as people look at us and see him as the one caring for me, but because he has such a good understanding of this, because we both are so into learning about this and, and really um, like fighting against our own internalized ableism and what we're taught by society, it just kind of works. That's beautiful. I mean, just the meds alone, being handed your meds alone is, <laughs> is so amazing. But it's also, you know, of course, how wonderful it would be if our society was different and mm -hmm. we had the systems in place we needed to be cared for. But also I think it's so wonderful to be in a relationship with someone, whether that's, you know, it happens to be romantic for you and it's a life partnership, 
whether it's that or it's a friendship or it's mm-hmm. a fam- familial relationship to challenge our own internalized ableism mm-hmm. and care for one another in a way that maybe doesn't look the way it's portrayed in um, in the culture, mm-hmm. right? Or the way that we're, we're told we're supposed to be independent and not need anyone. Well, when you have an illness and a chronic illness, or you have neurodivergence, you can you can thrive in a way that's so much better mm-hmm. than if you didn't have that. I mean, what would you do if you didn't have that? It's it's really yeah. kind of humbling to witness the care, to be a recipient of the care. And this is the discussion that we have sometimes, like what would you know, what would I do if something happened to Oscar suddenly? And because I've developed a lot of friendships with people with similar kind of interests and I've said I would probably start like a group living situation in which I would invite all my other kind of single chronically ill friends or disabled friends who have a similar way of looking at the world into a group kind of living situation in which we could we could get cleaners in we could you know we could share each other's care even though we're all sick and that's exactly what Johanna had was sick women theory the first iteration of it Mm -hmm. talks about um and 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 their pe- their piece isn't just talking about sick people. It's talking about any kind of marginalized individual. The sick woman is this archetype for any marginalized individual. So, and, and I think this is why I talk about my work as um, as like a cultural activism. A lot of a lot of people I know who make art and are sick and disabled get frustrated when they're called activists because they're like, I'm only being called an activist because I'm disabled or because I'm marginalized in some respect and because my voice isn't normally heard. And I have the utmost respect for that kind of viewpoint. But with my work, I do see it as a kind of cultural activism because the aim is to change how people view certain situations, certain people. It's to challenge the stereotypes that are built into us. Mm -hmm. It's to challenge the ideas that have come down throughout history. You know, something we were talking about earlier, we were saying about um, you're too, like, attractive to be be ill. Mm That comes from this really Victorian idea of like they they had they had fr- phrenology was like this really really racist study of the brain you know this idea that you could look at someone and tell if they were a criminal or if they were ill or if they were evil or if they, you know these were genuine studies yeah. and these things are still there's like a trickle down fragments of them in our society and we just presume because it's 2022 that we're all you know these enlightened beings um it's definitely not true <laughs> it's just not the case you know no. yeah I, well um i want to read something you wrote about a series of collages that you made this year in 2022 you write i created statements of self to represent my experience of illness and disability. They are often reactions to a negative stereotype or reductive representation about illness and disability that I have encountered. I encounter these in pop culture, the media, medical culture, history of medicine, or from the people in my life. They often don't come from a malicious place, but rather a lack of education of the nuanced experiences of illness and disability, to which I can only speak on my own experience and use my platform to signpost or to highlight the experiences of others where I can. My statements of self aim to counteract the the effect these reductive tropes have had on my fragmented sense of self. So in one of them, in one of the collages, you write, be well, and another it has the words, I am sick. I will never get better. And it plays into what we were just talking about, Mm -hmm. this strong commentary on how dominant culture encourages people to be well, to quote unquote, be well. And I'm curious for you, what healing looks like as a disabled person and what does being well mean to you? And, you know, does, does it sort of differ from what, what you, your thought process was when you made that collage of like what people are projecting onto you. Mm-hmm. So in terms of this, this came up again and, it, and it's, it's really strange because I thought that I was at a stage in my illness where most of the people in my life really understood that I was never going to be well in the way in which they view wellness, like healthy, you know, non-disabled, etc. which is a joke because... Anyway. What does healthy even mean? Yeah, what does healthy even mean? Exactly. And after my last surgery, which most people understood was just another process of taping back up my kind of body that's falling apart and will always be falling apart until 
until it's the end, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, most people understood that, but some people just expected me to be, to just be healthy. And s- sometimes th- those feelings are so strong that you kind of trick yourself into thinking that you're going to wake up and be healthy. Or like, there's like this tiny little piece of you that just thinks that you're going to wake up and be the person that you were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever. And that that obviously isn't the situation. So my version of wellness, because you have to, I, I feel like I'm having like a, I'm constantly fighting between wanting to tell people how sick I am and wanting to tell people that my life is worthy and has value and not to pity me and that I get a lot out of life. And it's these like two things that shouldn't be in opposition, but sometimes feel like they are. So not wanting everyone to be like, oh, your life has no value. You're sick all the time, but you can be sick and you can get a lot out of life still if if your state of being is accepted and concessions are made or not concessions but you know your access is prioritized so if i'm allowed to rest if i'm allowed to have a flexible schedule if i'm allowed to um have days where i physically cannot do anything except for take my meds it doesn't mean that I guess my version of wellness is finding uh, a point in my life where, and I don't, I don't think I'm there quite yet, where I can do all the things I want to do in a time frame that suits my body, and be aware that there's always going to be there's always going to be things that come along and throw my schedule off and throw my plan off because I'm, it's never going to go to the plan. That's just not what my body is. What that's just not going to happen yeah and that should be okay and, and accepting that and having people around me that are accepting of that I think that would be wellness for me and that would be healing for me say it again for the people in the cheap seats <laughs> <laughs> well, that sort of brings me to I kind of want to talk a little bit about crying in the hospital yeah um and this duality I think so much of what we go through as patients it there's so much duality to what we're feeling in, in a certain moment. Mm-hmm. And it speaks to exactly what you were just talking about. This duality of feeling like you want to be worthy and you are worthy. Mm-hmm. Not you want to be worthy, you are worthy. And also you, your life has value and also you want people to know and see you and see how you're feeling on a given day. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious to know in terms of the crying and the feeling, you know, for me, so much of it has been like, I feel gra- massive gratitude, of course, for, for the medication I take every day and the treatment I receive and uh, the blood work I get. And you know, I feel that gratitude genuinely, but I mm-hmm. also feel deep grief mm-hmm. and have done. And it's gone through many iterations. For you, how has the experience of feeling grief, if you do feel grief, and also demonstrably showing it in terms of crying in front of medical professionals, but also just feeling your feelings, basically. Yeah, for me, it's it, it crying in front of medical professionals has been really different in different scenarios. So previously, crying in front of medical professionals has caused what I spoke about earlier of this jump to she's a difficult patient or she's exaggerating or she's hysterical or she's and invoking this idea of the like hysteric woman right and part of this is because in my I, I I think it's because on my medical history there are traumatic things that have happened to me that I think point them in that direction more easily than they would everyone and that yeah. that might not be the case it might just be because I'm a woman and I'm a white woman so I'm in a more privileged position than a lot of people mm-hmm. um but still that goes there but then more recently when I've cried I in my most recent hospitalization I had a uh, nearly life-threatening reaction to a medication I'd never taken before and I one of the symptoms was psychosis of and it's happened they've seen it happen to one other Pers- these particular medical professionals had seen it happen to one other person before. It was in Barcelona with my, with my medical professionals who know me really well. And the fact that I was crying and the fact that I was so, and I said to them, I think I'm going to die. They took it really seriously. Um, 
which I'd never had before. When I when I've said to people in the past, medical professionals, I feel as though I'm going to die, that's when it's kind of switched the other way and they've been like, okay, something fishy's going on here. Mm. Not, okay, this patient is is panicking. Maybe there's a signal somewhere in her body that's telling her to panic mm-hmm. because something really serious has gone wrong. Right. Which there are studies on that, um, on the idea of panic or the idea of as being like um as being like a symptom of like a heart attack or a symptom of a pulmonary embolism or, right. or something, right? I feel like I have not answered your question and I've just gone on. No, this is exactly <laughs> this is exactly what I wanted to talk about. Is yeah. is sort of like just when we show emotion, mm. I think in a medical setting, it can often be taken the wrong way. I don't I, I think to say the wrong way is is not the right verbiage even it's just taken in a way that's not necessarily in tandem with what's actually happening Mm -hmm. and the overreaction that I've received has has really surprised me at times Mm -hmm. when and that's why I I sort of tied in this idea of grief and gratitude too because when you're faced with a serious illness and when you live with a chronic condition and you're in and out of hospital repeatedly over time there is trauma there so of course it's going to come out Mm -hmm. and it's normal that it comes out it's it's I I don't really understand and that's why I want to have these conversations why it has to be something that is taken in such a serious way Mm -hmm. rather than meeting the person where they are if that's in a crying fit why is that met with, oh, this person is hysterical? Mm-hmm. Because it's a natural human emotion to, it's not an emotion to cry, although I've, I've tried to make it one. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's a natural reaction to cry. Yeah. And it, it's a release. It's a release. And it actually has a soothing effect on our nervous system as well, physiologically. Yeah. So you, you definitely answered my question and then some. It's, it's, it's more to kind of, think about how we can shift perception around mm-hmm. around the grief that we feel as patients mm-hmm. and because you mentioned saying you know I want to die I'm curious whether you have a relationship to your own death and whether you've sort of become intimate with it if you think about it yeah I have actually um my my in Prior to probably my first, like, my first really serious hospitalization was for a pulmonary embolism, and that was a a life-threatening condition, and that wasn't believed on several occasions of going in. And I think that my relationship to my own death wasn't, at that point, I hadn't really ever thought about it. I was in my kind of mid, uh, early 20s at that point, actually, and it was just something that I hadn't really thought about. And then... Later, when I was, I'd always assumed that I I started to get sick and I always assumed that I was going to get better. And then later when I was going for my fusion, uh, I was at a point of really either thinking I'm going to die from not having the surgery or I'm going to die during the surgery. or Maybe there's a tiny, tiny chance that I'm going to survive and it's going to be okay. And that I didn't believe to be the kind of which is what happened. Well, I'm not okay, but I'm okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so one of the things, and and I really appreciate my neurosurgeon for doing this because he never hid the fact that I could have, could die in that surgery and that it was extremely serious. And he wanted me to talk to family members about it and he wanted me to warn people. And so one of the things that I did was I prepared to die. And so I, me and my husband, we got married because we knew that he, my partner, Oscar, Binter, we got married because we knew that he would have more um rights uh over me medically and that I wanted him to have and that he would also he would have more help in the UK if I died if his wife had died than if a long-term partner had died so we got married and I learned about all the things that my family would have to do if I died and I created a folder like I literally prepared with stationery you know I created a folder of who they would need to call, how they would extradite my body or where they could cremate me in Barcelona. Like I prepared for it. 
and I mentally prepared for it, I was not scared going into that surgery. And that sounds like it should be a lie, but it's just not. I know it was totally out of my hands and I, and I was totally prepared for whatever outcome and I felt kind of at peace. And then I survived and I hadn't prepared for that bit. <laughs> mm. And I was really shocked at what came next, which was survivor's guilt, which was really, which was all the stress of life, all the responsibility, all the planning for the future, all the going back to the UK and not having medical care, all of these stresses, which when I was going into that surgery, were just not there, just came back on top of me. And I thought that if that surgery was successful, I... Well, I, had, I, I guess I hadn't even thought about it. Mm -hmm. Most people would think if that surgery is successful, she's going to be a lot happier. And everyone expected me to be. But I had really bad depression at like month three. Like suicidal, horrific, horrific depression for a long time. Um, it's one of the reasons that we got my dog, which is two, you know, two years later after my surgery. Because I, I had felt a peace that I'd never been able to feel before. There's a writer who talks about preparing for death as kind of the closest you can get to experiencing death. Obviously, no one can kind of really experience death. I know there are people who die and they come back to life, but the idea of experiencing death, if you, if you, if you live onwards, is, is not really a thing. I think the closest that you can come to it is like fully preparing for it, right? Mm -hmm. And so then to not die is a really unusual experience. And one that you don't have any expectations about really because you're so busy preparing for your death mm, and that preparing everyone around you mm -hmm. so when you came back and you were grappling with that was there feelings of like the feelings that you describe of having suicidal thoughts was it linked specifically to this experience of preparing for your own death or was it more because you were experiencing depression I think it was depression and I think that I don't know what I don't know what the experience would have been like if COVID hadn't happened because three months up three months after we got back to the UK not even I can't remember exactly COVID happened so I'd given been given this like I wasn't well but I'd I'd start going out to work again wow. being from in the position of being in a bed you know being as ill as I was and then working being disabled in the world but working at gallery and then sort of a month or I think a month into the job, mm -hmm. everything shut down. I was a top shielder. I was back in a, in a room again, um, stuck in a room again. So I think there was so many things going on here. One was I hadn't planned for what next if I survived. And there was survivor's guilt because I had people contacting me constantly. I would hear from like three women a day, occasionally men, but generally women. I'm also experiencing this. What can I do? Can you help me? Can you answer my questions? And I wanted to help them, but at the same time, I'm one person. Can you help me fundraise? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like tens of people, if not, like, I can't even quantify because I've, at times, I've just been, had to been like, I'm really sorry. I have to just focus on myself. Yeah. yeah. Feeling guilt about that. Feeling guilt that all these people had put money and invested in my well-being and I and I wasn't super happy all the time or thriving feeling angry that I'd been given more capacity and that I was stuck in a room again and that also being a really triggering experience because it was the same room it was a room in a family home and at one point I was literally shielding from the other people in that house because they were they were going to school and work at one point so I was in a room a lot wow. of the time yeah and that was this kind of like PTSD experience of being back in that room. So I think there were so many things going on as to why I was feeling and still and and another thing I was I was put on um I was given medically induced menopause by a doc by a gynecologist for my endometriosis which is another condition I have. Yeah. And I've been told since that that was like one of the biggest mistakes that they could have done because my hormones were really awry. So I think there is like m right m multiple layers of things going on yeah. that contributed to that feeling and the feeling that comes back a feeling that does come back mm -hmm. but luckily now it's kind of not as constant and as intense as it was yeah I really appreciate you talking about it so openly and frankly because I think it's 
quite common actually mm -hmm. for people to have really serious medical interventions or surgeries and then to experience feelings of suicide of wanting to to commit suicide and I want to dispel the myth that you're alone in it or that it's somehow outsized it's it's an outsized feeling when actually when you look at the chain of events that can happen in someone's life the reaction to it and the feelings of survival survivor's guilt and the feelings of especially in lockdown being stuck in a room I was also a top shielder and mm -hmm. had had similar tra trauma come back up feeling like it's too much to continue is to me not as strange as some people may or I don't know if strange definitely isn't the right word but the reaction that I've received from other people uh, when I've been open about my own suicidal ideation has not really been useful mm. uh, because when you go through something so serious and especially when you don't know if you're going to stay or go to then have to be faced with the reality of living right now mm. it can be a lot to, to to face and so for the feelings to come up and to to manage them in any way you can I love that you got a dog yeah <laughs> is brave and then to be open about it is also brave because I think we don't we don't always have the language to talk about these things in a way that uh feels safe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people find it shocking who haven't experienced it but it shouldn't be I mean no because if you've experienced those things and you know that you also might experience them again and it might be an experience that you keep having throughout your life right it's no wonder that it's going to be so difficult for, for you like to to kind of think do I have the energy for that for your system to hold mm. to to even just get through the day mm. and how great to also recognize that there's joyful things and how great like to to go back to what you were talking about before of like this sense of worth that you have and there's so many things you want to do and the art that you make mm. but also going back to the duality of things it's mm. just natural that we're gonna have uh, moments continuously where we don't feel good about being alive and that's okay mm. it doesn't for me at least and I can only speak for myself it doesn't mean that I don't want to be alive yeah you know or I don't want to continue uh making things and being in the world and having connections with people mm -hmm. uh so I just I appreciate bringing this in because it's so complicated and yet we need to talk to each other about it yeah and I haven't seen anywhere particularly that, and I'm sure there's, there is, but yeah. I haven't seen anywhere that's particularly talking about it or anyone that is, as of yet, I'm sure maybe after this I will. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and with my next, with my surgery after that came the realisation that I'm probably going to be having these type of surgeries for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's how it, that's what's going to keep me alive. So... It's this really unusual, I'm going to have to keep fighting really hard to stay alive. Do I have the energy for that? That and finding the energy and finding, and sometimes just saying I don't have the energy, but Oscar, do you have the energy for that today? And say, so, yeah, I've got the energy for that today. Right. <laughs> I'm going to take it on. And asking someone else to hold it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Witnessing each other's trauma, which yes. is what Johanna had for Sick Woman Theory talks about. Yeah. Witnessing it, holding it. <laughs> You know, with with kind of consent and warning. Yeah, um, being with it. Mm. Yeah. So I want to shift and talk a little bit about pleasure, which is a sort of a 180 from talking about death, but it's something you explore quite a bit in your work, this idea of reclaiming pleasure for yourself. And it's something I've really struggled with myself to allow in and have had to really work at and continue to. Would you read an excerpt from an article you wrote about reclaiming your own pleasure? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it says, The social model for disability views society's lack of access as the thing that disables a person rather than the person's impairment. This model isn't perfect, yet it's helped me 
to not just know, but also believe that I'm not the problem. My body, its functions, even its dysfunctions are not shameful. A culture that perpetuates those feelings of shame is. We do not need to change our bodies, we need to change our culture. The processes of claiming pride in my identity as a disabled person and reclaiming pleasure have had a symbiotic relationship. As a sick and disabled person, I have encountered many barriers to sexual pleasure. Pain, fatigue, fear of injury, lack of privacy because of a reliance on family and feeling as though I'm no longer attractive because of my illness. I have, like many in the disabled community, experienced infantilizing assumptions that because we are disabled, we do not have sexual desire. Well, I and many of us do have sexual desire, just as many non-disabled people do. Reclaiming and making space for my desire has become more important to me since becoming disabled. In part, this is because it has become a radical act to simply talk openly about sex as a disabled person. But more importantly, with a life where daily pain is guaranteed, how can I deny myself the relief of pleasure? I love that so much. And it's really the idea that it's a radical act to talk about your own pleasure as a disabled person is so it spoke so deep uh, to me on such a deep level, because for such a long time, I felt like I had been desexualized. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know for you right now, what does your pleasure practice look like? Like not even necessarily in terms of sex, but also just reclaiming that pleasure for yourself. So I think in some ways, it's really strange because I think that in some ways my illness has, has, has it's changed. I'm in a, like a committed kind of, uh, what's the word where you only have? Sex with one person. Monogamous. <laughs> monogamous, there we go. <laughs> uh, monogamous relation. I'm in like a monogamous relationship. And in some ways, my illness has made my ability to talk about pleasure and to talk about... Because as a, as a disabled person, if, if I'm going into a situation, and it, and it can be self-pleasure, it doesn't have to be with someone else, but where how we do things has to be spoken about we have to get consent and we have to get in a position that's not going to be painful and we have to talk about what's going to work on any given day. We have to have these conversations that I wasn't having with with sexual partners prior to being ill because, or with myself, because it wasn't seen as like sexy or cool or, but because we're having to think about so many more things in terms of protecting our body because the but because my, the fragility of my body is a bit more obvious than someone else's, it means that we're also talking about the good, what, what feels good, as well as what not to do, because that could be dangerous. So it comes in part because I'm with someone I feel a lot more comfortable to do that with. And, and it's not just, like you say, it's not just in terms of sex, like it's also in terms of other types, other types of pleasure, like allowing yourself things that you may call like guilty pleasures or something in it saying okay today I can't get out of bed so I'm gonna watch a show that makes me feel really good all day and I'm not gonna feel crap about it or like it doesn't just have to be sexual pleasure but I think that a lot of the shame that I carried about my sexuality prior to being sick and about my body and about its functions have kind of had to drop away because of what it's like to be in the medical system in which your body is just like observed and um, seen by so many people. I've had to become really comfortable with my own body. And within that process, it's allowed me to just, just have more frank and open communication when it comes to pleasure and to, and to not feel embarrassed about planning for it. Mm-hmm. Planning a safe a safe, comfortable position where you can, and it not having to all be spur at the moment, and mm-hmm. this idea that that asking to kiss someone is not is not sexy somehow, yeah. right? Yeah, and how empowering to have those conversations. Yeah, to experience more pleasure because really, it's just conditioning that tells us it has to be spur of the moment. But to prepare for your own pleasure is it actually could maximize it in a way 100 percent. it's yeah. really it's exciting and like thinking about uh sex toys that are like aids right so that can help you so all these different all these different things that they have now that can 
so if me and my partner go around a shop or are online looking at a shop that has different devices that can help us experience pleasure and know that my wrist isn't just going to dislocate because all I have to do is press a button and that right. could do something exciting you know what I mean yeah these things add to the excitement or yeah. we're going to use this on that day when we know that you know my mom has the dog or yeah. <laughs> something like this like yeah and also I've had to get to a position where and I'm not like it with everyone in my family where I've had to also say to my family because I'm still living with my parents mm-hmm. you know I'm in an adult relationship in which we want to have sex sometimes and we need the space to do that. So we, we, am I even talking about my pleasure with people outside of the relationship in order to like yeah. facilitate it? But also how amazing, <laughs> like, it, you, you know, the amount of people who talk about that with their parents is slim to none, right? Like, yeah. I'm not, I don't want to massively generalise, but how, also how empowering to be that frank because pleasure should really be available to everyone Mm. and that you've sort of been pushed into having these conversations maybe it feels uncomfortable but at first but then you you just have them right and it becomes it becomes normal with my mum it's never felt uncomfortable because that's just how she is but with yeah with other people it's become it's becoming just more of a normal thing in the same way that I have to talk about my bowels I have to tell people no I can't come at that time because it takes me this long in the morning to make sure my bowels are empty and I can't leave the house until they're empty because then they're going to empty themselves at any point on the journey and that's not going to be okay for me. Right. You know what I mean? So being in a position where I can talk about that. I love how you talk about you have the language a sort of second hand with Oscar, your husband, for when you need to go to the toilet. Mm. And he knows because you've had conversations previously about it and it's an ongoing thing between you. It's just sort of a secondhand thing that you can rely yeah. on. We we used to have code words, but I don't. Now we just say it. Yeah, <laughs> we've got past the code words now. Now we're just like, I need to find a toilet now, and and he knows what to do. And I think it, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about communication from him as well because he because he has autism and because he takes a lot of things at face value. I I can't be passive aggressive with him. If I say everything's okay, even if I say, yeah, everything's okay, everything's okay. <laughs> right. I've learned that I have to communicate my needs exactly as they are. And for the most part, if I say, this is what I need now, if he's able to get me there, he will. The way in which I need to communicate with him to be understood has taught me so much so much about communication generally. Yeah. Like, I've really benefited from learning to just communicate my needs and not expecting someone to be able to read my mind as well as we've spent so much time together that we can in, interpret for one another. We, we can be in a room and he will just say, drink some water now because, you know, he sees that I'm dehydrated before I do. Or, right. So there's so many different things going on, I think. But So much care. It's really humbling to, to learn about and witness. So I want to ask you three questions to close. If you lived in a world that completely catered to your disability, what would that look like? I've thought about this one a lot <laughs> because I was getting frustrated because uh, I saw an event that advertised itself as accessible to all, which is just not, we haven't got there yet. There is no event which is accessible to all, right? And my, what would it be accessible to me wouldn't necessarily be accessible to other people. So this is going to be really selfish. <laughs> but <laughs> As it should be. For, for me, yeah, exactly. Yeah. For me, it would be um, having having medical professionals that view me as a human and having medical professionals who knew about my illness really, really well. Having comfortable seating in every room, indoors and outdoors. Having comfortable benches mm. along the street. Having pay that sustained a good standard of living for two days work a week. Having a society that put people's pleasure and happiness no matter what situation they're in no matter how much they earn no matter how well they are as a priority no matter how they identify in any kind of characteristic identity characteristic and also it would mean lots of really like like more practical things like everything would be at eye level because I can't bend over (laughs) so all the cash points would be exactly at my height yeah (laughs) (laughs) uh 
but yeah, just 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 an understanding and communication and and less pressure to be producing constantly mm-hmm. and not to take time for rest. Yeah. I and, think. and cushions everywhere. Cushions <laughs> and just be in a cushioned room all the time. <laughs> What's one thing you do to keep yourself creative each day? There will always be a bit of creativity. So if I'm if I don't have any time in a given day to to write or make artwork then my creativity will come out in my, the clothes that I choose for the day or in how I choose to do my makeup if I don't have the energy to get dressed or go out I will will write poems on my phone or I'll be making collages on my laptop sorry my iPad in bed I don't do one thing but there's just always an element of like innovation innovation and creation and I, th- I think that disabled and sick people are just innovators because we're constantly having to go we're constantly having to rejig our whole way of being in the world to fit around this new symptom or this new illness so we are just kind of we have to be creative right yeah yeah and fit into a world that isn't really made for us yeah um and then what's one phrase or saying that you always come back to it's kind of an obvious one but it has saved my life on many occasions and it is the trust your gut I, my mum has said this to me many times and and it's not always going to fit for everyone but when there's been something seriously wrong in a relationship, in a, in a medical situation, in a living situation and there's been this feeling at the back of my head or in my stomach that's telling me you need to get out of the situation it's like listen to that feeling because I do believe there's there's way more going on with our bodies there's way more communication happening and we're taught not to listen to it. Yeah. So trust your gut because whenever I've been in an actual life and I'm not saying that this always happens because maybe it doesn't. Right. But so far, whenever I've been in a life-threatening situation, my body's been telling me, my body said, you need to, you need to make them listen. Yeah, I love that. I need that. I need to have that emblazoned on my forehead (laughs) the amount of times I haven't listened to my intuition Mm. and trusted my gut it's astounding actually because most of the time our intuition and our gut is is the thing Mm. that's the right thing to listen to but I really respect you for tapping into that rather than tapping into the conditioning Thank you. I think I was quite a bossy child, so (laughs) I think that's probably where it comes from. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Charlie. Hopefully it's the first of many conversations like this. That was our show, So Life Wants You Dead. Thank you so much for listening. You can engage with Charlie Fitz's work on her Instagram at charliejfitz, where she writes and makes art about disability, practices disabled joy as an act of resistance, and post photos of her really cute dog. You can find more information about her in our show notes. This episode was made in collaboration with and support from Soho House. Many thanks to Jamila Brown, Min Shrimpton, Olivier Garrity, Sagal Mohammed, Erica Bonet, and Theo van der Brucke. Our editing is by the amazing Olive Olin. Our illustrations are by the extremely talented Renee Fagan. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe. Leave us a review or rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you did. Rating us and subscribing really makes a difference. You can find us on Instagram at SoLifeWantsYouDead, where we talk about what's coming up and how we most likely need a nap. Thanks so much and see you next time.